Indie or AAA? Indie. IAPs or ads? Ads, of course. Casual or strategy? You're listening to Level Up with Melissa Zalou. Today on the show, we have Jeff Gurian from Congregate here with us. Jeff, thanks very much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. So let's kind of start with you telling us a little bit about yourself. You work at Congregate today, your VP ad monetization and marketing. But how did you get into the gaming industry? Um, kind of got lucky, got found by um, a VP at a gaming in, uh, company called Outspark that did downloadable games. Unfortunately, the company is no longer around. Um, but uh, they needed marketing help. It was very early on in the marketing days when uh, acquiring users was super cheap. Uh, so my job was easy for a while. And then uh, ever since then, I like the dynamics of gaming, how fast it changes. Um, and I've been in gaming now for about eight years. Are you a gamer? Um, I used to play more. Then I had kids and not so much anymore. But uh, I still play a lot of mobile games when I have time. Casual? Mostly, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the first game you ever played or you can remember playing? Um, I was a big fan of the Intellivision system. So there was a game called Utopia, which you built little islands um, and just built structures on them. And then hurricanes would come and wipe them out. Um, Sounds super positive <laughs> and enjoyable. Uh, yeah, semi-real, I guess, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, there's a baseball game and a football game. Burger Time was a big one, but mostly the Intellivision games were... Somehow I ended up with that system growing up. Uh -huh. And what was the last kind of last game you couldn't stop playing? Um, Maybe it was pre-kids. No, I mean, Adventure Capitalist was addicting for some time. I've been playing a lot of Golf Clash recently. Mm -hmm. I think the mechanics of that are extremely compelling. And I know the guys who are uh, the creators of that game. Mm -hmm. So um, you said you started in gaming when buying, buying users was cheap and, and a little easier. Um, how do you think the ecosystem has changed? I mean, we know it has. Uh, is it is it near, near impossible these days? It's not impossible, but you definitely have to be better at it than mm -hmm. in the future. And then in the past, um, when I started doing web acquisition for gaming, we were getting um, people to download one gigabyte games, um, and we we're paying on a cost per registration. We were paying on average. Uh, anywhere from 30 to 75 cents per user. And it was pretty typical to what Facebook acquisition was like mm -hmm. for when Facebook gaming took off. Um, and I think mobile started there, um, but mobile quickly matured mm -hmm. um, as, as it has just in all, that, all facets, both tech and, and marketing mm -hmm. and, and gaming and game mechanics. Um, and yeah, it's just, I mean, acquiring users for dirt cheap is still possible, but it's more the exception than the rule. Mm -hmm. And potentially fraudulent? Uh, there's, yeah, you, you do have to be careful for fraud, yes. Uh, right. Sometimes if it's too good to be true, it can be. And what about kind of the shift from, from web to mobile? That's something that kind of you have a perspective on that maybe not everyone in the industry does, kind of because Congregate has that web platform and, and the mobile publishing side of things. So kind of what was that transition like? You started in Congregate in, in web? Uh, yes. So, you know, ad units is a big one. Um, mobile right now is being is dominated by video. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when we first started doing acquisition on web, it was all about static ads and mm -hmm. advertorial type placements. Uh, video at the time was reserved for brand, you know, being dominated by brand buyers and the cost was just basically too expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so you were able to acquire scale with, you know, just a simple 300 by 250 static advert, maybe some animation to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then video became, you know, and I think in mobile started the same where static ads, um, interstitials, were the dominant source of inventory for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and that shifted to video, both in the rewarded space, both even on casual apps mm -hmm. as a, reward, a video interstitial, and even Facebook has moved their um, ad units primarily from static to more right. dynamic and, and video. Um, how do you think the move, kind of the shift to mobile and the gaming industry at large, not just in terms of marketing, has kind of impacted game design and the kind of games that are being created? Are we kind of heading inexorably towards kind of an idle gaming um, reality because that's that's all that mobile can sustain? I mean, it, it's been good and bad. The uh, the the. Bad news for developers is it's, it's because of the market has, acquisition has changed. It's forced them to be more hyper focused on data and monetization to get their user values high enough to run marketing. Mm. Um, that's 
you know, forced a lot of smaller devs into work, you know, not force them, but it's, they have to work with publishers now because they don't have those um, capabilities in house. Mm -hmm. They don't have the marketing tools in house. Um, It's also kind of gotten them away from just kind of building a fun game instead of building a fun game and publishing it, having, making whatever money. um, If the game doesn't kind of monetize well, um, if the the graphics aren't good enough for Mm -hmm. Apple and Google to get featured, like where are users going to come from? Mm -hmm. And so it's semi, you know, the ecosystem is semi forcing the hands of developers to get better at game design, mm-hmm. uh, to get better at retention, and to get better at monetization than they have in the past, at least if they want to succeed, succeed in, a, in a major way. Mm-hmm. And that's from our standpoint, too, when we're evaluating titles, our two major criteria now are, is the game featureable? Will Apple and Google like the mechanics? Will they like the art? Mm-hmm. Um, and can we do, do paid UA? Mm-hmm. If we can't do either one of those, if we can't get a feature or run paid UA, um, Success is going to be limited. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's very difficult to get users and very difficult to scale and have any real success in the title. So how often does kind of um, incorporating monetization feature in kind of early game development, at least for congregate titles? That's part of our game evaluation process now is what are the, you know, if the game is, if we have some data on the game, like what are those mechanics? What's D1, D7, D30? Um, what's the purchase rate? What's the average purchase amount. Mm-hmm. Um, and now even ads has become extremely important. How many ads are people watching? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is it, what kind of ad units are there? You know, do they have an offer wall? Should they have an offer wall? Um, so it's definitely we evaluate the entire process, the entire kind of data set. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where we come in as a publisher to help out devs who um, might be weak in a certain area. We can suggest um, implementations mm-hmm. and um mechanics that could improve retention or improve their ad monetization mm-hmm. um, and get them to that higher LTV where they need to be becomes, to get paid you at, yeah. Right. So um, talking about ads as this kind of or ad-based monetization, which is kind of, it seems to have really mature, matured, let's say, in the last couple of years, especially with the rise of rewarded ads. You have games like Cross, Cross Your Road who are building games around rewarded video and, and, and knowing that they can sort of what that will equal out to um, in, in fast revenue. How do you think the dynamic between ad-based monetization and IAPs is going to play out over the next couple of years? Um, it's a good question. I, I, I think it still varies by game type. So a game like Crossy Road is very casual. There's not a ton of stuff you can buy. You can buy a you know, car. Um, there's, not, there's not a ton you can buy in those games. The, the economy just isn't that rich. Um, whereas a game like... Um, you know, Game of War or um, Clash of Clans, like mm. the I, the economy there, like there's tons of stuff you can buy. It's all high value. And that's kind of where the primarily they're going to drive their revenue from. Mm-hmm. So ad based monetization does for us, it fits within every game, but the amount of revenue it contributes vary by game type. Nice. So a very casual game, and I'll use um, Adventure Capitalist, um, mm-hmm. which is one of our published titles as an example, you know, that game derives there's not a lot you can buy in the game. Um, some some power ups, some speed ups, some some uh, costumes and whatnot. Um, but because there's not a robust IEP economy and there's a deep ad integration, about eighty to ninety percent of that game's revenue is ad driven. Um, compare that with a game like Animation Throwdown, the Quest mm-hmm. for Cards, um, which is a collectible card game with a Fox IPs. Um, That game has a very robust economy in terms of card packs and things you can buy to help your experience there. That game has about 30% of its uh, revenue driven by ads. Mm -hmm. So it it does vary by game type and the mechanics and the economies within each game, which will influence how much revenue is derived from each point. Now, it's important regardless to make sure you're looking at both the ad revenue and IEP revenue in... um, in whole, and yeah, right. uh, especially when you're looking at UA buys, because you know even a game like Animation Throwdown, you know if we excluded the ad revenue from our LTV calculations, we would be underbidding by thirty percent what mm-hmm. we could, which you know that could be the difference between scaling a game and not. Right. So that's something you're in kind of a unique position to see because you're kind of combining both the monetization perspective and the UA. Yeah, and that's, you know, we, we see how those go hand in hand and before and, and still a lot of companies, I know those two departments tend to be very siloed, mm-hmm. um, but they do go hand in hand. Um, you know, you need to know what your CPMs are and because that affects how much money you're making, what your ARPDAO is for ads, and mm-hmm. that affects your LTV, especially in games that are ad-driven. Um, so if you don't have that whole view, then, you know, if UA doesn't know how much that the value of ads has increased and they don't know that they can increase their bids mm-hmm. accordingly, um, it's something that 
you know, needs to be an active conversation, not something that they go, wow, our user value went up the past three weeks. Um, Maybe we can increase our bids now. It's something Mm -hmm. that should basically, you know, be done in real time. Do you think that a role like yours is likely to kind of pop up a lot more in the industry moving forward as those kinds of that loop between monetization and marketing gets kind of closed more, um, that you'll see more combined roles like this? Um, that's a good question. I know a lot of companies still keep them very distinct because the disciplines and information and data between them are, you know, they're interrelated, but they're not completely dependent on one another. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it can be handled into individual groups as long as those groups communicate effectively. Yeah. Do you have a preference? Um, I like having insights to both. Mm-hmm. Um, That's very diplomatic. <laughs> I mean, I think they get, just because of how well they do go hand in hand, and I think it's also helped given our UA team perspective on um, their ad buys, because if we're primarily buying on a CPI basis, you know, the amount of inventory we get is dependent on the CPMs that are being mm-hmm. driven within the apps we're buying from. So, you know, if they don't know what those CPMs are, they don't know how much they really need to move the needle to get more volume. If our CPMs are, say, for a rewarded video, say $5 in mm-hmm. that we're buying from, like just bumping up our bids incrementally is not going to get us a, a jump in volume. If we need to know we need to get to a $10 CPM um, to be competitive, then we can figure out what our bids need to be to get there mm-hmm. and also how much scale we get for that. So it's helped our UA buying side from a standpoint of understanding what our CPMs are um, and how competitive they are in the marketplace for volume or not. Mm-hmm. Is that something that's also kind of um, easier to do when you're when you're able to kind of look across a wide range of titles as you are? Um, it does help, um, especially when we're looking at evaluating titles because we have a ton of benchmarking right. data we can provide um, to know what the engagement rate should be, to know the number of ads per day, to know what the CPM should be by title, uh, to know what placements work and, and whatnot. So um, from us, it, it's... It's beneficial to have those benchmarks. Yeah, each you know, genre doesn't necessarily kind of inform on, on another. No, they're they're dramatically different based on usually based on game type. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some devs who uh, don't have that access to that level of information, they're kind of not knowing. You know, is my implementation good? Am I making as much money as possible? Do I have too many ads showing or too few? Mm-hmm. So for us, having that information and benchmarking data across a wide range of game types helps us to work with devs to make sure they hit the right metrics mm-hmm. versus them having to kind of guess yes. and figure it out as they go. Mm-hmm. It sort of shortcuts the learning curve. Yes. And how does UA sort of differ across different um, game genres? Both, I'm, I'm you know, imagining CPIs for hardcore games is gonna be, are going to be higher yep. than, than for casual, and creative probably differs. But beyond that, what kind of um, differences do you see when marketing different types of titles? I mean, it's, it's a lot, again, driven by the CPMs that those are, are driving and how much scale we can get. Um, you know, we have different strategies depending on the titles, um, depending on who we're working with, or who our dev partners are. Um, you know, sometimes we just do undirect payback. Like mm-hmm. we want every dollar we spend to make a dollar back and we want to prove that out to our developers and show them via reports that, you know, we're spending their money effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for some titles, even internal ones, you know, we might take a more aggressive approach to UA because that, especially if we own the, the game mm-hmm. um, and we are doing more first party publishing now, when we own those titles, that allows us to be a little bit more aggressive to drive mm-hmm. revenue. Um, You know, because we also know as well that, you know, a paid UA at scale also drives organics. If Mm -hmm. you move high enough up in the charts, you tend to get more organics. So we're often trying to find the balance point of volume in a particular title at a particular Mm -hmm. price point, um, but also seeing if we can, you know, if we can nudge that up a little bit, you Mm -hmm. know, do our organics go up with it, and we look at that holistically. Um, I kind of want to jump to talking about channels, um, different marketing channels, because obviously the, the industry as a whole is moving budgets in general, moving to digital and to mobile. But on the other hand, you also have kind of game companies getting into TV mm-hmm. um, as they also become brands in and of themselves and sort of start doing more traditional advertising. Do you think we're going to see more of that? Um, I don't. Um, I think people have fallen under the semi spell of seeing, you know, the big companies like Machine Zone and mm-hmm. Supercell do this. Um, and when you're making a million plus dollars a day on your app in the app store, you have money to experiment with it. Uh, what I think a lot of developers kind of, and they see that and they think it's effective because they're doing it. Um, granted, they have the leeway financially to do that without, you know, if it doesn't work, mm-hmm. it's not a huge hit to their bottom line. Right. You know, at the end of the day, TV can work. Um, but in, to get there, it requires a pretty big investment, um, mm-hmm. sometimes in the multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're testing out time of day, you're testing out day parts, you're testing out channel targeting, you're testing out geos. You need to be able to 
you know, have a good baseline of installs to see is TV providing a lift. Mm -hmm. You obviously can't buy one commercial that does nothing. You have to buy a series of them over time. So, you know, from a smaller dev or medium sized dev, if you're looking at potential of just to try to get TV to work of, you know, say a minimum fee of $100,000, but a good test is probably more like two to $400,000. You know, is it better to invest that money in TV, which is semi-questionable, or to put that money into, into performance marketing, which you can actually see, mm -hmm. you know, what you're getting in return um, pretty much right away. Uh, so I, I do think the bigger companies will continue to dabble and experiment with it. But I think by and large, the small and mid-size um, companies, some will do it, and I don't think they'll have great experiences with it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's mostly a function of figuring out when does it make sense to spend that money and can you afford to lose it uh, via the uh, investing in a performance marketing channel. Because the other side of that coin is also kind of the, the advances in creative on mobile and things like playables or interactive videos, which can kind of, okay, they're not providing a TV-like experience, right. but they are providing a rich experience on mobile that kind of can give you both sides both the kind of sexiness of right. TV and the, the hard data of performance. Right, and I think that's where, especially the growth of mo rewarded video in mobile apps is because you're semi-pre-qualifying those users. Mm -hmm. You know they're playing a game, so you know they're a game player. You're not showing up in a news app, you're not showing up in a you know calculator app or an alarm clock app. You know they're showing up in a game, you know they play games. Uh, versus TV is having the same, it's the same issue showing up in a utility app. Mm -hmm. You know some of those people do play games, but there's also a lot of people in there who don't. Mm -hmm. And you're not able to effectively target them because you're just showing up in a very broad app. TV is the same, you're showing up in a very broad medium. Um, some of those people watching the TV will play games and do play games, some don't, but you're not able to segment that mm -hmm. uh, and get the qualification that you do through a targeted buy um, via rewarded video or something like Facebook where you actually know they're playing certain games. Mm -hmm. So uh, knowing that people, knowing your re advertising within games and knowing that you're reaching gamers is, is from the flip side, kind of from a publisher perspective, also I imagine quite scary because you are running ads in your app because you, you know it's, a, it's an important kind of monetization strategy, but the fear is, I guess, always, am I going, are these going to cannibalize my users? Um, I mean, I know on our end, this we see that this doesn't happen. Right. On the other hand, I'm sure you encounter a lot of reticence on the part of developers that you guys are starting with. Um, we have developers and producers as well. Even our internal, like, championing ads took a while uh, at Congregate to mm -hmm. become a, a, what it is today. Um, a lot of that was subjective. Like, just we feel it hurts retention. We feel it impacts gameplay. Um, I think rewarded video and interstitials are different in that regard because rewarded video is totally user opt-in. Uh, interstitials are forced. Uh, you have no choice but to watch them, and you, yeah, you could get turned off by them. Uh, rewarded video, if you don't want to watch the ad, um, you don't have to. You can, mm -hmm. you know, choose never to, you know, if you watch the ad, choose to engage the ad unit, watch an ad, uh, and you like it and you like the bonus, cool, you can keep doing it. If mm -hmm. you don't like it and be you like, don't. that was worth my time, just stop. Uh, so at the end of the day, it doesn't, and, and we've found that it doesn't impact retention. One of the, and one of the key things uh, to evaluate is make sure you have the tracking in place to see that. Like if you're able to tag um, as an event, similar to, you know, someone making a purchase or hitting day three return, but tag people who start ads, tag people who finish ads. Um, and then once you have that data on a user level, you can see of the people who watched ads, what was their retention via the people who did not watch mm -hmm. ads? And, and use that analysis to prove out the impact yourselves. If you're seeing a, a negative trend on retention, yeah, maybe you want to scale back the ads mm -hmm. or be less aggressive. Um, if you're not, though, there's no reason to keep, you know, to keep the ad placement where it is or to expand it or um, see what you can do to keep growing revenue, especially for the opt-in placements. That's, it kind of goes to talking about looking at rewarded advertising or opt-in advertising as kind of a micropayment type thing. Um, and it's kind of evolved beyond being an ad to being kind of a driver for the in-app economy, exposing mm -hmm. users to kind of the, the extra premium features or premium functionality they can get with IAPs without actually getting them to spend any money. Um, yes and no. Um, we actually divorce our ad placements from IEPs. So we, or otherwise um, it, it can lead to ad gold farming basically. Mm -hmm. um, people are just gonna keep watching ads to get currency and there's not much of incentive for them to actually go buy the hard currency. Um, also, when you watch subsequent ads, the ads devalue, there's uh, degradation in CPMs. Mm -hmm. So if people are watching five ads to get currency, uh, the first ad is way more valuable than the second ad, which is way more valuable than the third. And by the time you reach a fifth ad, you're actually making less, but you're still giving away the same amount of currency because mm -hmm. you can't 
tells it to your user, like my fifth ad is worth less, so you're going to get this reward. Uh, you're going to get a lower reward. So we tend to put our ad bonuses around things like speed ups, um, timer reductions, bonuses, um, but never tie them directly to the hard currency um, mm -hmm. to avoid the cold farming. The only ad placement that does tie to currency is the offer wall. Mm -hmm. And that's something that it lives in the store and does give away hard currency for doing specific offers within that placement. Um, I want to talk about the relationship between kind of publisher and, and developer, um, because Congregate in many ways is kind of like a, an enabling infrastructure for the kind of indie dev community. Um, would you say that's correct? Yes. That's good. <laughs> um, do you think, um, I'm curious to see how often you guys um, come, I maybe mean, this is a bit provocative, but come up against um, a developer who says, no, I don't want to implement ads, or no, I don't want to run this creative, or kind of what, how do you mediate that dynamic between leaving uh, an indie dev their independence um, and also kind of helping them navigate this world um, as a successful business? Right. Um, and that's a good question. That's something we evaluate during the upfront process because we create models based on here's the game um, type, um, here's what we expect the retention numbers to be, here's what we expect the IAP numbers to be, here, we, here's what we expect the ad engagement and ad revenue to be. Um, if the developer is going to completely push back on ads, that changes our evaluation model. Um, because even a hardcore game you know, that has a ton of IAP can still make a 30% lift in revenue from ads, at least mm -hmm. in the hardcore titles we have. So if the dev just absolutely says, no, we're not going to put that in, then we have to go back and reforecast because now we're basically cutting out 30% of our revenue. Um, and then internally we have to make that decision of does this make sense? So if that 30% is the borderline between like a marketable game and non-marketable game and they're not going to want to put in ads, you know, we can go to them and be like, well, we don't think your LTV is high enough to be you know, a marketable title, um, it, this no longer makes sense for us to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, I don't know that we have, but we could potentially walk away from a game that if they're not going to put in ads, because it changes the, the, economics. the whole economics and the whole forecast for how much we think we can make. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, you know, we want to work, you know, we, our company, we need to make some money and keep the lights on. We want our developers to make money and keep, you know, their lights on and make, making more games. So, you know, if they're, if they're kind of opposed to putting in ads, it's, kind of, it's also a semi-red flag mm -hmm. because, like, what else are they going to be opposed to do that could help improve monetization and performance? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want to work with devs who are open and flexible. You know, we don't want to force things down their throat, but at the same time, it has to be a good business case for both of us to work as a publisher and developer together. Um, so we're always trying to toe that line between features, functionality, requirements versus not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, I mean... We don't come across that a lot now. We have enough data to basically prove to developers that ads should be in their games. And we have enough references where if dev is semi-hesitant, we just point them to one of our other devs and they go, yeah, th you know, this is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't tend to run across that as much anyway. now than we did a couple years ago. And when you're kind of evaluating uh, titles, you've said you, you're looking at kind of obviously the, the full data set, both in terms of marketing and in terms of monetization. But my question is whether you kind of also look at game trends, like AR, is, you think AR might be big or VR might be big. We'd like to have a game like that in our portfolio. Right. We do look at trends, but they're harder to evaluate because you don't know the metrics behind them. Um, so why we're always kind of evaluating and looking out for those kind of new things like AR, VR, um, you know, we haven't jumped into it in a major way because we can't benchmark what retention will be. We can't benchmark what the ad engagements or what the CPMs will be. We don't know what the IP rates are for those games. And they're starting to become, you know, as they become more popular, like that information will disseminate itself through the industry. And then we can decide if there's a business case for that, um, for those type of titles. But as a publisher, and because we want we want to be successful, we want our developers to be successful, we're a little bit hesitant sometimes to take on a new tech outside of um, like an AR or VR, mm -hmm. um, because we don't know if that will be as successful as the developer deserves or, or, or we want as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for our, from our standpoint, sometimes those are, because we're not able to make those investments and because we're not able to guarantee or know the exact performance, we tend to take a wait and see approach um, mm -hmm. on some of those. Makes sense. Um, last question, a nice broad one. Um, how do you see the game space evolving in the next five years? Um, it's a good question. I think AR is going to be a lot more prevalent than VR. I just, mm -hmm. I mean, just the, the one of the draws of game, of especially mobile gaming, is the ability to play quick sessions on and, and to do so mobile. Um, 
you know, why standing there waiting for the bus? I, if you're wearing a VR headset while waiting for the bus, you're probably going to get mugged. So um, <laughs> I, I don't see VR. I see VR as like a console mm-hmm. and um, in-home type entertainment system. I think there will be um, mobile apps that draw that include VR type elements and that do well in the VR environment. I just don't think it's going to be as mainstream and as popular mm-hmm. as kind of, you know, mobile gaming in, in general. I think AR can tend to, just because it's more of an enhancement of existing technologies, and as mm-hmm. the processors get better in these new chips, like doing AR-type graphics become less um, arduous for you know um, phone users to play. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't drain their battery. You know They have the right graphics chips for it. Um, so I think AR will be uh, become more popular more rapidly. Um, on the ad side, I, I just see continued involvement of... Um, Video ads, um, you know, programmatic is always one of those big buzzwords that hangs out there. You know, I think brands haven't got gotten into rewarded video like they should. I don't know that brand CPMs are on par with performance yet. But if Amazon can figure out how to, when you view the toaster and you get those 10, you know, get those kind of carousel ads or web apps ads programmatically driven of like, here's, here's 10 other toasters for you. When Amazon can figure out how to slot those kind of product views into a video, they become more valuable to brand advertisers Mm -hmm. and I I think become more crowded uh, space for brand side, which will then make it harder for mobile acquisition Mm -hmm. um, because you're then giving up. Yeah, you're giving up. If you have five or so ads, you're giving up one or two of those to brand. Uh, There's fewer ads for mobile uh, advertisers to compete in. So that in turn requires even more diligence on IEP and ad optimization to get your user value high enough to do you paid UA. Interesting. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us here today, Jeff. Um, looking forward to having you on here again. Thanks. Indie or AAA? Indie. IAPs or ads? Ads, of course. Casual or strategy? Uh, strategy. PC or mobile? Mobile. Free to play or pay to play? Free to play. iOS versus Android? Uh, iOS, just because I'm an iOS user. <laughs> landscape or portrait? Uh, landscape. Unity or native? Uh, no preference. 3D or 2D? 3. Super Mario or Sonic? Super Mario. AR or VR? AR. Shower or bath? Uh, shower. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) 